Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for SME's technical community and yeah. aerodynamic manufacturing satellite session. In today's webinar, Next Generation Additive Manufacturing, you'll learn how AM continues to disrupt traditional manufacturing with unique capabilities, including validation and testing methods, use of novel composites and metal materials, and speed of, mar and speed of market of finished parts. Our presenters today will focus on high temperature metal materials used in aircraft, designing for multi-purpose hybrid applications, selective cooling of electronics, and continuous fiber thermostat composite materials. Good afternoon, I'm Carl Mitroff, the AeroDef Conference Manager. Thanks for joining us. Before we get going, uh, just a few housekeeping items, and you'll recognize um, right away that your microphones are automatically muted. Um, if you have any uh, technical issues. Um, if you want to use the chat feature and, and throw that question in there, we'll try to respond uh, as quickly as we can. If you have questions for our panelists or moderator uh, during the duration of this webinar, there's a Q&A box you can use. And in the event of any technical glitches on your end, uh, remember we are going to be recording this presentation uh, and we'll make it available on our AeroDef website. Moderating today's webinar is Dr. Yuping Gao. Yuping is the founder and president of Castion Company, where his vision is to advance the state of the art in additive manufacturing and industrialization. He actively works with the DOE National Lab on fundamental AM process studies and NASA and the NASA Flight Center on AM materials and applications. Dr. Gao is a fellow of the Laser Institute of America and previously Technical Fellow and Discipline Chief, Manufacturing Engineering at Aerojet Rocketdyne. He has over 30 years experience in materials and process development, design for manufacturing, product development, manufacturing engineering, and technical consulting. Yuping is an active member of the Aerodef Conference Advisory Team and is very influential in the development of the additive manufacturing conference content. Thank you, Yuping, for moderating today's webinar. I really appreciate your time dedication to our RLDF program, and I'll kick it off to you. Thank you, Carl. Um, yeah, Carl, thank you so much for introdu introduction, and uh, we have this uh, quick data session of the RLDF, and um, we're going to do this uh, deep dating. Uh, so every, every presenter has uh, nine minutes to present, and at the end, uh, we have some time for the overall uh, Q and A. Uh, and Carl already said, um, you know, uh, on the panels you can type it in, and uh, we'll make sure everybody can see the uh, Q and A, and we'll have those things answered. And today we have this uh, pleasure to have uh, Paul Brad and um, um, Kevin Fu and uh, Lee Curran. Uh, so. I I feel sorry, and uh, so uh, Dan Brady has a, a family emergency, so he can't be here with us, and I'll be the uh, first one to present. Uh, so my topic is on the additive manufacturing of refract metals for the um, extreme environmental applications. Um, so next chart, please. So the outline is we're going to introduce uh, what we do and the background why we need this um, uh, refractory metals additive manufacturing, the current issues, and the um, additive manufacturing process uh, for the um, uh, refractory metals, and conclusion and the future works. Next, please. So uh, Cassian is a small. <coughs> Small business, and um, which I, I funded started a couple of years ago, and we do the advanced development for uh, additive manufacturing. Our reason is to speed up the um, additive manufacturing's um, uh, industrialization and also advance the other materials which hasn't been uh, additively produced uh, uh, that is uh, available uh, to be produced. And so, uh, our um, uh, our uh, advantages is um, we focusing on the um, uh, fundamental of the process. So we're doing a lot of enabling things for the uh, uh, you know material and the structures for all kind of uh, applications. And uh, so we have this uh, pr our protocol is based on the Gal block, 
It's a physical methodological based uh, development uh, protocol and methodologies for rapid and robust AM development. And we're also focusing on the microstructure level optimization. So we make sure, you know, the material we can produce in an additive way is actually, um, you know, has the highest quality. Um, the other things we do is, uh, if you implementing this, um, you know, gall block development protocols, you pretty much you can implement these things as a printer agnostic. So you don't have to worry about it. Uh, these things uh, printing on this machine cannot be, pr be printed on the other machine because we're focusing on the microstructure level of the uh, uh, optimizations. Next chart, please. Um, yeah, I uh, sorry about that. And can I go back to one more chart? Okay, so all the images you see on the bottom. Those everything up here are refractory metals. So you can see the refractory metals can be produced in the turban blade thrusters, um, any kind of uh, thermal isolations and hypersonic sharp leading edges. That's on the bottom of this. And um, so uh, as you can see, the producibility of additive is extremely, extremely um, you know, uh, agile and varco, and so you can produce almost like um, any shapes which is not able to do in the uh, traditional manufacturing. To the next page, please. The reason we pick up this um, is the demand. Demand for the hypersonic research and the commercial space activities driven size for demand for the um, uh, structural refractory uh, materials. And with the increasing demand, if the traditional metallurgical process, the ingot metallurgical process to produce a refractory just um, have a hard time to keep up with. So typically you got to wait for nine months to get the uh, materials uh, certified produced and um, then you start to fabricate. So you're talking about uh, lead times between, you know, nine to 12 months. On the additive, on the other hand is, if you have a powder, qualified powder produced, you can produce parts within a couple of weeks. And uh, so you can produce net, net shaped, and that's a big, big plus for the refractory metals because refractory metals are difficult to uh, manufacture, uh, subtractively to produce. And uh, we also improve the material pro uh, properties. Next, please. So the reason we're talking about refractory is refractory has a extremely high melting point. And so it's typically refractory materials are, you know, twice, the melting point is twice as high as the super alloys. And particularly in this, um, uh, this kind of refractory material we deal with, which is niobium C-3, the density is on par with uh, the uh, super alloy. And it's, it is extremely desirable for high temperature applications. Because traditionally, this material is always expensive, so always used on the you know high cost weapon system, satellite, and now we're making those things are extremely extremely affordable. So we're looking for this um, uh, order of magnitude cost reductions, so that can benefit major I mean uh, wider industry. So with all the all the benefit. And uh, now this material is actually in the production of the, um, there's a lot of space uh, spacecraft uses the niobium uh, as their thrusters and other uh, other functions fly in the space now. Next, please. So one thing about this, uh, uh, you know, additive manufacturing is currently the state of ma additive manufacturing is um, the technology is ahead of the science, and there's a lack of common agreeable best practice that is based in the science. And there's a lot of different practices, and they're not exactly uh, science-based. Next, please. So I don't have to go through this entire thing for uh, you know fundamental uh, additive because uh, here people know this a lot. And so next page, please. So what we want to show is the difference between the uh, 3D printed and the raw material. And just because the webinars doesn't show the details about the green structures, next page. Yeah, it doesn't really show. And so we create a complex uh, a green boundary that is not um, 
you know, now to, um, showing in the traditional rod material. And that gave us a, a significant benefit of how this material will perform in the high temperature uh, range. Next, please. So typically, when we print this, this material is extremely stable. If you look at the uh, right-hand side, so the, as printed material going through two hours at 2,900 degrees, you can see the green is very stable. It doesn't see this explosive green growth. But on the lower one, you can see the rod material. It says extremely uh, extreme uh, green growth. And on the right, left hand side, you can see the material properties compared rod with the 3D printing. The 3D printing is far better. And at 2400 degrees uh, touching temperature, it's 1.8 stronger, 1. times 8 stronger, stronger than the rod material. Next page, please. Let's see, uh, so overall performance, you can see the red lines versus the green, uh, the blue lines. The performance is always higher, and uh, we don't have the test data for the um, uh, for the passing range yet, and we are doing the uh, uh, passing range temperature test. Uh, so in in you know you know 3D printed material has its reason to be uh, stronger and uh, better perform. Next page, please. So now you can see this uh, uh, enlarged uh, uh, images. There's a lot of material here we produce are impossible to be produced uh, in a traditional manufacturing way. And a lot of them is, a, you know, you have this thin wall stacking ring or you have a poor structures, uh, you know, in the, in the go part of the, uh, you know, a solid shell. And those things are not easy to be produced. And if you look at the refractory metal turbine blade, that was a, the first in the world. We can produce that sophisticated internal structures in the refractory material. Because refractory material being high melting point, they don't have a lot of other manufacturing process. You can't, uh, you can't investment cost the refractory material because they take the, uh, the uh, oxygen away from your, uh, the ceramic uh, crucibles the shells. Next, please. So in conclusion, and uh, I've been uh, mentioning all the benefits of this, and uh, so you can uh, see it, I'm gonna read through this uh, a lot, and the next please. So in the future, and uh, we're seeing, you know, the Niobium 713 is not the strongest materials we've been using, and uh, there's other, a lot of other materials we've been considering using, and they're far stronger, and you can see where the target is, where the line we need to go above, so those are the things that we're working on now. Next, please. Well, thank you so much. I think I'm running out of time. And uh, let me have this pleasure to introduce um, uh, Paul Brett. Let's put his uh, presentation. Yes, and uh, uh, Paul Brett is a principal R&D engineer at uh, ACI uh, Technology Inc., which is in uh, Navy Electronics Manufacturing Center of Excellence. He has uh, over 20 years experience in high reliability electronics and thermal management, and he's currently combining his material expertise with computer modeling in the 3D printing to develop mm -hmm. innovative design for Navy project. And uh, I think uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul. And this is a, a great interest to me as well. We print the 3D printing, the code plates. So Paul, the audience is yours. Thank you, Yuping. Uh, additive manufacturing and multi-physics software have fundamentally changed our approach to thermal management. Next slide. Typical designs were a simple tube or channel cold plate, but now selective cooling can be accomplished using complex 3D printed designs. If you look on the, the top left quadrant, you see the tube, the tube and channel design. Uh, it's a low cost, but the coolant surface layer, the layer closest to the hot components, moves slower and is less effective for heat transfer. Also, the sequential coolant path gets increasingly warmer with a smaller delta T for heat transfer. Now, better approaches that we've, we've tried uh, provide parallel cooling. Uh, if you look in the lower left, uh, the foam graphite 
uh, very conductive material. Uh, by having several parallel paths and going through a foamed, highly conductive material, that's an improvement. Uh, the top right shows injected molded copper pin fins, uh, which uh, uh, essentially puts copper in the path of the coolant and does a little bit better for heat transfer. Uh, but the most effective approach we've tested redirects the coolant to impinge directly on the hottest surfaces, and that's the, the lower right. Uh, and, and with that approach, you get increased heat transfer. However, this coal plate was, was uh, designed uh, and manufactured by brazing thin layers of copper containing precisely drilled holes, and when they're stacked up uh, precisely, they, get, they form channels, and that redirects the, the coolant right to the heated surface. It's, it, it's a slow and expensive process. Next slide. The design we developed uses cross-directional microchannels and manifolds to form a massively parallel impingement flow design. Starting with the unit cell in the middle, we use simulations to determine the optimal manifold height and microchannel depth, and then assemble the cells into a plate producing large manifolds and high surface area microchannels. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, the bottom right, you see as the coolant moves through the manifolds, it makes a uh, 90 degree turn. In, in this case, it's going up. Uh, so it makes a little turn up, and then it jumps over to the adjacent manifold and then exits. The now warmer coolant exits, all gets together, exits through the uh, adjacent manifold, and then uh, gets returned uh, and comes back as uh, cooler material uh, after it uh, goes through some sort of uh, heat exchanger. Uh, this design progression is shown on the next slide. Uh, so you see from the left side, you see the design of a single unit cell, which is uh, like a quarter of the design. Uh, then merge it to a half cell in the middle, and then put all those cells together uh, in any fashion that you need, and you get the cold plate. You get the, the full cold plate is on the right. Uh, and so every point where there's a connection between the manifold and a microchannel, becomes a new position where impingement flow hits the hottest part of the cold plate. Next slide. All right, so here's the simulation drawing showing the cross-directional manifolds and microchannels. Uh, if you look in the left side, you can see uh, on the left without a, the microchannels are, are on the top surface and they're running sort of vertically and the manifolds are running cross between the two tubes you see. Uh, the, the material, the, the coolant can't get out of the manifold until it turns direction and goes into the microchannel and then goes into the next manifold. So then we, we actually printed these and uh, you know, we, there's a copper, picture of the copper coal plate. I have one here, it's probably too little for you to see, but. Um, uh, in the top middle, you see the printed plate. You see that as design views, uh, showing you how the manifolds, the, the larger openings, are coming in from the left going to the right, and the, the uh, microchannels are on the top or the upper surface there. And you can see the X-ray. So, so after I printed it, I X-rayed them and show that uh, uh, the openings that uh, that I designed into this. Uh, actually reproduce on the x-ray. So it, it came out uh, to be as I expected. Uh, with no assembly or brazing required, uh, the additive ma manufacturing provides a highly complex design with a large heat transfer and high reliability. Next. So this experimental testing provided results approaching the numerical simulations. You know, on the left side, I have what I predicted, and the right side is uh, my experimental results. Wasn't quite as perfect on the copper coal plate, uh, but the uh, I tried three different metals, the titanium, aluminum, and copper, and uh, 
the copper didn't print as uh, accurately as, uh, as I wanted, but the titanium and the aluminum came uh, pretty much right on what the predictions were. Next. So that brings me to selective cooling. So we had a uh, critical thermal environment on an aircraft where the coolant was only 15 degrees cooler than the maximum temperature allowed for the components. This required a design that, that cooled a certain port of the, uh, the circuitry more than the rest of it. Uh, by placing microchannels only where the additional cooling was required, uh, the, my analysis showed that uh, while I achieved overall cooling of the whole circuit, the selective cooling resulted in an additional 11 degrees margin at critical locations. And as you look at the, the bottom right, you see I just have uh, six or seven microchannels in the middle of the plate, uh, and just above it is a, a curve of temperature as you go across, and I got significant reduction at that point. So if I had a hotter, a, a hotter component in the center of the cold plate, I would be able to keep it cooler than, than even the rest of it. Next slide. Also by using the, the multi-physics software, I can investigate uh, just the, the complete design of this. Here I made a small modification and just by changing the output of the uh, coolant, instead of having the in and the out on the same side, by having the out uh, exit opposite the, in, the input side, uh, I'm able to achieve much better heat transfer coefficients. Next slide. Uh, I can even investigate things that we couldn't possibly machine, like a conical input. So in order to investigate uh, uh, the distribution of the coolant as it went through all these parallel flow lines, uh, I find that making it a conical section and letting it compress smaller and smaller allowed me to get a better distribution uh, throughout the cold plate. Next. Uh, and these are some of the results that we got investigating all different parameters. So by the ability to use a simulation software uh, before printing it gets me to uh, so much further ahead in what, I, what I'm able to print uh, and then uh, experimentally test and verify and validate that this whole simulation works. Uh, I got the biggest uh, improvement in heat transfer uh, by changing, simply changing the input and output to opposite sides. Uh, next slide. Uh, so this this impingement flow cooling that that uh, that can only do this in your uh, can be applied to uh, uh, hot platforms that have high reliability and performance. And with the selective cooling, I can mitigate hot spots. Uh, the design mit uh, minimizes my weight, minimizes coolant flow rate, and I get a very small pressure drop. And I think that's it. Well, this is a great. Paul, thank you so much. And, uh, you know, I wish I <laughs> we reach out to you early to discuss those things. And, uh, you know, we constantly uh, see this being an issue. And uh, I guess we'll save some questions for you later on, on why the difference between the culprits and the predictions. Is that the additive just not uh, giving the quality you wanted? Um, but let me move move ahead because we're on the schedule. And uh, next, my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Calvin Fu. He's uh, from the University of Delaware. He leads the um, um, University of Delaware Center for Composite Material, and um, he directs the um, additive manufacturing um, laboratory. And he receives. Um, uh, let's see, where was the, they received the uh, CMX award uh, for composite excellencies in manufacturing, and uh, he is a uh, MP Young Professional Emergency Leadership Award a recipient. He has over 100 papers, peer review papers published, and with over 9,000 times uh, being cited. And uh, Kelvin, please. You have an audience. 
Oh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, so uh, my topic is about uh, additive manufacturing of continuous carbon fiber reinforced thermal side composites. So uh, my name is Kelvin Fu. I'm from University, University of Delaware. So my lab is uh, focusing on uh, 3D printing, especially on uh, continuous fiber composites. Okay, next. All right. So uh, when we hear about uh, 3D uh, composites, 3D printer, in most cases, so you will hear like uh, continuous fiber composites. But in most cases, almost all the commercially available 3D printer on the market or under development, so they are focusing on uh, uh, thermal plastic or they are using uh, UV curable uh, thermal cell resins. But, I, but, we, but we know that, okay, thermal plastic or uh, UV curable resins. So uh, they cannot match, I mean, with the, the, the current state of art, some of that composites, especially if we are targeting for the aerospace and high performance vehicles. So in this case, we require high performance small set resins. So uh, that's our interest and that's what we are doing the past few years. So uh, in this slide, you will see that, okay, in 2019, so my lab, uh, invented the world first 3D printer for continuous carbon fiber and thermal cell composites. And we named this technology as LITA because this is based on localized implant thermal assisted 3D printing technology. So this is actually a, a pretty new uh, a technology. It's based on a, a new knowledge developed in my lab. And in this technology, so we can achieve simultaneous wetting, wicking and curing. So uh, everything we put together so we don't use pre prep we just use dry fibers, fabrics, or uh, no matter it's carbon fiber or uh, uh, glass fiber, so any type of fibers. So we are just using dry fibers and use the, the, uh, the, the high performance resin so we can find our market. So we, we just do the printing together. Okay, so uh, our, 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 our data has shown, okay, uh, our uh, composites has a very high fiber volume fraction and good mechanical strength. So this is all in one design. So uh, everything we are purchased, I mean, I mean for the fee, fee stop materials, so they are on the market. So we are focusing on the, the, the equipment development and also the tooling design. Okay, so on the bottom, you can see that is our uh, uh, concept design. So uh, uh, we invented this uh, uh, 3D printing platform. So it's controlled by a robotic arm. And when we deposit the resin on the surface, so we create this gradient temperature distribution on, on, on fiber surface, okay, to uh, simultaneously trigger the resin flow and impregnate into the, the, the pore space between the fibers of the, the carbon, carbon tape or, or fabrics. And finally, if we achieve higher temperature, so those resins can be you know, cured immediately because in traditional composites, if we wanna cure it, right? So the cure rate should be a very slow because you know higher cure rate, so that will cause a lot of a uh, high temperature, you know, generated within the, the composites. So this can damage the the, the the composite whole structures. But in our design, things we uh we we print and cure each layer, and in a very fast speed. So in this case, we don't need to put in the in the oven for the additional post curing. So so this is more uh, energy efficient and very uh, very fast. So and also last year we received the Chemex. Uh, this uh, award uh, for composite excellence. So in the manufacturing equipment and tooling innovation award. So we are very proud of, uh, uh, you know, to get this award. Yeah, next. Okay, so this is the fundamental science behind this technology. So you can see here, so we can provide any type of heating direction on the fiber. So uh, either within the fiber on the surface, so this can create the gradient temperature distribution because now we are using carbon fiber, highly thermoconductive, which is very good. So this can help to uh, transfer the heat, okay, along the fiber direction. And this can cause the, the, the temperature, dis, uh, I mean, the gradient temperature distribution along fibers. In this case, we notice that, okay, so the resin viscosity can be changed as well because we know that main challenge for thermostat is that when we increase temperature, so we can see a very high viscosity drop or a very significant viscosity decrease, right? So this will cause a lot of troubles when we do 3D printing, right? So in this case, if we apply this gradient temperature, so this gradient temperature distribution along fibers can help to uh, guide 
I mean, the flow direction of the resins. And once the temperature, like I said, increase a little bit, so uh, reach to the curing temperature, so this resin can be cured instantly. So uh, from the, those, uh, 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 I mean, those low to high uh, temperature viscosity, the contact angle change. So we put into equation to calculate the, I mean, the the, the uh, liquid absorption capability. So here you can see we are using the PS value. So this is a liquid absorption capability to show that, okay, at the higher temperature, so the resin and carbon fiber system will have very high KS value. So the higher number of the KS value indicate the whole system will have much stronger capability to absorb and to, uh, to, to, to trigger the flow of our resins. Okay, so based on the, this, those uh, capillary force, so, and also the, dy the dynamic change of the surface tension, you know, between the resins and the carbon fibers, so we can motivate the flow of the resin and finally, you know, get a very high volume fraction and successful 3D printing of composites. Okay, I'll go next. All right, so this is our uh, earlier demonstration. As you can see on the on your on your left hand, so uh, we just use a Joule heater. Okay, it's uh, like a resistive heating. So we are using this resistive heating as the heater to contact with carbon fiber to provide the thermal gradient. So if you see the Joule heater is on, so you can see when we put the resins on the surface. So the resin can quickly, you know, infiltrate and impregnate into the fiber toes and finally get cured. But if the Joule heater is off, so when we deposit the resins, so the resin will only stay on surface, okay? We know that a commercial resins, they have different viscosity, right? They have different curing, uh, uh, curing, uh, curing time. But, you know, if we can turn the temperature, okay, and also the thermal conductivity as well as the viscosity of the resins, so this property can be easily tuned to, to fit different applications. So in the middle image, you can see if we move this shoe heater along the carbon fibers, and then we uh, couple the resin deposition on the surface of carbon fiber. So we can achieve the continuous uh, resin infiltration and resin curing. Okay, so on the very right hand, so, so that is to show that we can do the vertical weekend curing. So this is very important. If we wanna print some very complicated structure, so those structure cannot be achieved by any existing uh, state of art compiling manufacturing technology, right? So uh, we can just use a vertical waking and a curing to do any type of job. And also our our plan, our dream is to do this in the free space and also in the outer space. We know there's no gravity or very low gravity in the in the international uh, station, right? In the outer space in this case. So so far no 3D printing can do the job, right? So they have to rely on uh, gravity to do the layer by layer printing. But in our case, you can see space on uh, 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 the capillary force, so uh, nothing about gravity, so we can do any type of printing demonstration. Okay, next, please. All right, so here is our uh, printed samples, and we do a, a series of characterizations. So uh, you can see we do the, the, the CT scan, so all the fibers are well aligned, and we didn't see the voids. Why there's no pores and voids? Because this is different from conventional composite printing. So it's based on capillary force. So during the flow of the resins and also the, the, the heating temperature, okay, so uh, the, the flow of the resin can actually squeeze out all the bubbles inside. So we have demonstrated a series of uh, experiments to confirm, okay, our method is actually not, not very helpful for the 3D printing, but also it's good method maybe in the future for the pre-prac uh, pre prep, uh, preparation. Okay, so on the bottom, you can see uh, we do the mechanical test, and uh, uh, the, the, it shows high strains and, and the modulus. Yes. Okay, next. All right, so uh, uh, here is our concept demonstration. So we can print any uh, uh, type of star shape. And also if we program our robot arm, so we can just print uh, directly on some contour surface, all right? So remember, so our technology does not require any type of both curing. So which means we can do some uh, some uh, uh, infield printing. Okay, so we don't rely on very expensive energy intensity, uh, energy intensive uh, curing to do the job. And also on the bottom image, you can see we can do the free space printing. 
because everything is controlled by the robotic arm. So the tension can be applied by, by the robotic arm, right? And also the curing, so we can do the curing uh, directly. You know, so so uh, you can see we can do any type of uh, printing. So this is different from the, the, the current continuous composites company that are using uh, UV curing uh, uh, polymer to, to do the job. So we are just using the commercial available high performance thermostat resins. Okay, so uh, no uh, uh, UV uh, curable resins are used. So which means, so our technology is more flexible. Okay, to, uh, to, to, to feed any type of resins or, or fibers. Okay, and so now we are working on the generation two. So uh, because we are uh, in, uh, in university, it's everything based on fundamental study. But my lab is also uh, uh, looking for some opportunity to commercialize this uh, this product. So so far, uh, I, I meet myself and my collaborator. So we have a, a startup company called Common Form. So uh, Common Form is a small start startup. So we are now trying to uh, uh, commercialize this technology and looking for some investment. Okay, to scale up this uh, 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 the world for 3D printing for the continuous carbon fiber ring for small set rather. Okay, next. Okay, I think that's uh, all my slides. All right, if you have any question, just feel free to uh, email me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, that's great, fantastic presentation. And uh, just pay attention to that chat box. And there are some questions for you and for Paul. And uh, so, with that, uh, we're going to introduce uh, Lee Kerwin from uh, Edison Welding Institute. So, Lee is a project engineer at Edison Welding Institute's uh, the additive group. And uh, he's a uh, uh, specialized in the large-scale direct energy depositions, and uh, he leads this um, EWI's large format additive manufacturing system. He's uh, well round in the additive manufacturing with the knowledge in laser powder, uh, in the uh, EB powder bed, laser DEDs, and uh, EB DEDs, the Bender Jet, and plasma powder uh, sterilizations, and um, he is just, uh, you know, a lot of times in the metal uh, additive manufacturing, people sometimes don't realize it is a welding process. So with expert from uh, Edison Welding Institute, we're going to have a fantastic uh, presentation. Lee, the audience is yours. All right. Thanks, Yifeng. Um, and thanks to uh, Carl and to SE, SME uh, for having me today. Um, so as Yu Ping was saying, um, my name is Lee Kerwin from uh, EWI, uh, working out of our, our Buffalo facility. Um, and it, it really is a good point that everything in additive is, metal additive uh, is essentially just welding over and over and over. So we, um, we've we done a lot to uh, a center as many uh, metal additive processes as we can here and, and to um, really become the, the experts in, in work across all of them and that's what I've done in, in my time here. So uh, my uh, presentation in, in this work is going to be based on uh, multi-process hybrid additive manufacturing. You hear a lot about um, hybrid manufacturing and uh, there's you know an additive process and then a uh, subtractive or, or CNC machining process um, and, and we have a little bit of that in this but what we're talking about is multiple um, additive processes uh, put together to, to make a single component. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the focus of this work was to um, develop a proof of concept part uh, using laser powder bed fusion, uh, direct ink writing, and uh, ultrasonic um, additive manufacturing. So the, uh, the test article that we designed was um, going to incorporate uh, design features from all of those. Um, the the overall goal of of using all three of these uh, processes to create one part is to uh, encapsulate a uh, RTD thermal sensor um, that uh, would not be able to be attached to the outside of components that are um, in hostile or hot um, environments where a, a sensor wouldn't survive or uh, be able to be attached using conventional methods to the outside of a part. Um, so the, the test article that we designed here um, was really just focused on 
utilizing the strengths of all the different processes. Um, you can see the, the bulk component that we designed uh, to be built in laser powder bed fusion is the, uh, the gray portion of the part in the lower right hand corner. Um, we designed that with um, a cooling channel uh, with no supports in it, overhang structures and things, um, like I said, really to demonstrate uh, laser powder bed fusion um, to, you know, be a, a demo of a, a heat sink part or something that could um, attach to, to pull heat away from a component. Um, we designed the, the slots for the sensor to actually go in in the top of the part. Um, one of the design constraints was that uh, the, the top where we were going to encapsulate the sensor had to be flat for the ultrasonic additive process um, to, uh, to lay down the material on top. You can see in the, in the center on the right there is um, how we layered the, um, the sensor and what we put on top and bottom of it. Uh, we were concerned about uh, the difference between um, uh, coefficients of thermal expansion for all the different materials that we would put in there. So we didn't want the sensor to crack or to any um, anything to break inside of there. So we put um, some ceramic paste and um, glue and epoxy in there to uh, to help with any deformation. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the actual execution of um, all these additive processes. Um, so the first Thing we did was build the laser powder bed part. Um, it was built on a EOS M280 um, out of 316 stainless. Uh, the sensor was um, built using direct ink writing. Um, so that's a way to build an extremely small sensor. Uh, the, this work was done um, in partnership over at uh, the University of Buffalo. Uh, they did the the deposition of the, the RTD sensor. Uh, so this was done using a, a copper graphene ink. Um, so they, they've done uh, a lot of work and a lot of studies on the um, properties of that copper graphene um, as a good RTD uh, sensor with a, a well-known um, resistivity to, to temperature. Uh, so that was deposited on a YSC substrate um, capped and, uh, and centered on that, that substrate. Um, and that's just to have a constraint to that sensor that would uh, survive the uh, elevated temperatures that we were aiming for here. Uh, that sensor, as I said, was uh, attached to the laser powder bed part uh, in a panel that was machined out. Um, the top of the laser powder bed part was machined flat uh, before going on to uh, the ultrasonic additive process. Uh, this was done over at um, Fabersonics uh, in Ohio. Um, so Fabersonics is a company that uh, started in uh, 2011 uh, based on some IP out of EWI. Um, so they operate as a fabricator and, and machine builder now that uh, we were utilizing this process to encapsulate the sensor. Um, so ultrasonic additive is pretty unique and uniquely fitted for a application like this where there's uh, very little heat input um, when you're depositing metal. Uh, it uses ultrasonics to um, deposit thin strips of material on top of uh, either a substrate or another part. Um, so in this, we were using uh, 6000 series aluminum uh, to demonstrate that we can encapsulate with a, um, a different material and that we could uh, get a good bond from dissimilar metals as we're encapsulating this uh, 316 part. Um, so we, we did that to encapsulate the, the RTD sensor um, and this can shield it from interference or uh, potential oxidation, any corrosion or um, to, to shield it from heat. And the, uh, like I said, the, the whole goal of this is to demo and prove out uh, that these processes can be put together to do this uh, with the aim of embedding sensors in parts that 
are in environments that you can't really put a, uh, a thermal sensor on it. Um, whereas if you embed the part or embed the sensor, you can put it in those environments. You can um, build it into hypersonics components, engine components, uh, anything, and do essentially um, structural health monitoring, monitoring. So you can measure the amount of thermal cycles that the part goes through, um, predict uh, what kind of stresses and fatigues and uh, everything you're going to have before a part failure. Um, so you can map those properties out and use an embedded sensor to pull something out of service before it actually breaks or, or um, know the, the timeline that you need to replace different components. Uh, next slide, please. So we evaluated the final part uh, after we encapsulated the sensor. Um, one by doing X-ray CT on it. Um, a couple of the earlier attempts, we did see um, cracking in the, uh, the sensor after encapsulation. Um, so in, in this final one with the final setup of the slot depth and um, how we were fixing that sensor in the channel, um, we saw no fractures in the sensor or the wires that were coming out um, in that uh, X-ray CT scan. Um, and then we also evaluated the sensor performance, and uh, you can see the um, temperature to resistance curve there, um, and that mapped the um, the known test that we had done on the sensor prior to encapsulation, so that that matched uh, the uh, the known properties of the sensor uh, that UB has uh, mapped out pretty well, um, and, and that was in a uh, box furnace heated up to 500 C. And like I said, the, this is really aimed at embedding different kinds of sensors. It, this doesn't have to just be an RTD temperature sensor. Um, this could be a myriad of different things. You could do this for train, um, contact, um, something breaking inside of a part. You could, you could build in all kinds of sensors with um, processes like this, whether it does need all different all three that we used here, or if it needs two of them, um, it, it really was a, a good way to prove out that this is feasible, that you can encapsulate a sensor and get um, reliable data out of it using multiple different additive processes. Because, you know, you think um, parts nowadays built conventionally, it's not using just one conventional process most of the time. It, it's a combination of multiple different conventional processes. So we're, we're starting to look at additive the same way. They, you don't need to replace part one-to-one -one from conventional methods straight to one additive method. You can build it out of multiple, and you can utilize the strengths of multiple different additive processes to, um, to develop a part or a process that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Um, uh, next slide, please. I think that's it. So yeah, that, that's all I had for you. Um, thank you for uh, for letting me speak and let me know if you have any questions. Please, thank you so much. This is a, a truly a multidisciplinary <laughs> additive manufacturing. And so now we have some uh, um, time for questions. And um, uh, so I realize that some of them uh, is already being answered. There's a two place people are putting on. One is a chat box, one is Q&A. And um, so let me answer uh, Sarah's uh, first question. Uh, so Sarah's question was in the refractory uh, metals, so why are the green boundary pinned? And so this is, uh, has something to do with this particular materials and uh, its mechanism in the additive manufacturing. So in additive manufacturing, when you continue to deposit the green, uh, to continue to deposit the material, the solidification, solidification occurs as the epitaxial grows, but then with a moving for moving the um, uh, uh, the heat source, so the grains continue bend. So you create a microscopic level of a uh, solidified green boundaries, and they pin to each other. They being some of them being eliminated by the uh, competitive growth mechanism, but the majority of them are epitaxial forms and they extend themselves and then being pinned together by this um, uh, highly uh, curvatured the uh, moving heat source. 
in the traditional way, people wouldn't think this is a bad. Uh, this is a, this is a better because uh, the uh, segregation occurs. But when you producing additive manufacturing in a microscopic level, and this is actually a fantastic um, uh, pinned green boundaries property. So. Uh, hopefully that answers that, and uh, you can continue um, uh, email or text message or uh, doing this uh, Q and A. And I think there's a couple of questions for Paul. And uh, I had a question on the um, uh, the copper additive manufacturing versus production. And Paul, did you examine the uh, materials quality in the copper? Because uh, Additive manufacturing of copper, the quality has, uh, uh, it's very challenging. And uh, is that going to be uh, something um, impact you uh, between the, uh, you know, uh, the measurement and the prediction? Yeah, that was one of the things that I was not able to do yet. I still have the cold plate and I didn't cut it open to see uh, what the discrepancy is about. I'm sure it had something to do with the print quality, just like you said. Uh, when I had these printed, the resolution that they guaranteed for copper was different, not as good as the aluminum and the titanium powders that that were used. Um, I'm not sure why that's true. I think it may be better now. I, I guess I printed this about a year ago, um, so perhaps they've solved it. But apparently there's an issue with uh, doing the metal printing of copper and getting uh, a high resolution print. Uh, and as soon as I'm able to cut this open and I'm not testing it, uh, I can find out exactly what's different. My guess is that all the measurements of the manifolds and the micro channel are not exactly as I designed them. Did that answer? Yeah, sounds good. And uh, yeah, absolutely looking forward to uh, discuss you with you more on the copper printing. Um, I think there are other questions. And um, uh, Carl, uh, how do we arrange this? Because it's directed from a, a different. Uh, I think Sarah has another question for the uh, fiber sonics. So Lee, can you answer that? Uh, I can. So I, I saw from. Uh... Sarah, it sounds like she's actually um, part of Fabrisonic that they're calling uh, the multiple additive process uh, synergistic AM. Um, so I, I think that's a very good term uh, for, for putting all these together. Uh, and I did see uh, there was one other question here from uh, Wade uh, directed towards me. So the what we did to correct the sensor cracking issue, uh, we, we increased the, the air gap that we created in the slot where we were actually putting in the sensor. Um, and then we switched from a ceramic paste to an epoxy and that had um, what was more forgiving and what was able to hold that, that stress more and deform a little bit more so that we didn't actually crack the sensor inside of there. Okay, I think there was a couple of questions for uh... Kelvin and uh, but he answered it on the uh, chat box. Kelvin, do you have anything you can summarize on those questions and uh, provide answers uh, uh, audibly? Yeah, sure. So uh, okay. So as you can see, our our uh, so our lab is not a company. So uh, uh, we are in the university. So we are more interested in uh, exploring. Uh, new knowledge, new science, to uh, uh, invent something new. So we are uh, actually, so you can see our our talk is actually based on our own research. So I know for the composite 3D printing, so far it's a very hard area, and uh, of course a lot of technical uh, challenges are there. So uh, my work is just to uh, uh, to to provide possibility or a new knowledge to those people who are working on industry or even in uh, uh, university to show that, okay, maybe we can, you, can, you know, we can see from different point of angle to see what is 3D printing. Because so far there are seven types of well-known 3D printing, but for composite 3D printing, actually uh, 
so far, all of those 3D printing, uh, I mean, composite 3D printing technologies are just based on the existing uh, state of art uh, 3D printing technologies. Okay. But, but you know, composite is completely different from other materials. It's different from metals, different from ceramics. Composite requires at least two materials. So these two materials have different phases, different length scales, and different states. Say carbon fiber is solid, resin is liquid, right? And also resin is temperature sensitive. So tradition from, uh, from, from, from dilute liquid to a high viscosity or low viscosity liquid, and suddenly to the gel state, and then to the to the to the to the to the to the hard solid. Okay, so this is a very complicated system. So, uh, uh, in from my point of view, so there's no uh, te technology over there available, you know, to to borrow and to modify. So we must create something new. So based on new knowledge, you know, for those uh, new composite additive manufacturers, and also. You can see our lab is more interesting in thermal set and continuous fiber, okay? Because this is a big challenge, and so far no one has ever demonstrated this kind of concept before. So my lab is uh, so far focusing on, on this area. So if you guys are interested in the, in my work, so please follow, uh, you know, our lab news and also our future uh, publications. So we <coughs> have done a lot of work uh, on this area. Thank you very much. Sounds great. Everyone, uh, you know, Paul Lee and uh, Calvin, thank you so much. I want to uh, give some time to our organizer and uh, thanks, Carol, for organizing this and uh, thanks the uh, SME Society of Manufacturing Engineer to provide this to a broader audience. Carl? Thank you, Yuping. Um, if I could ask, and there, there's one more question I think we can get to, and I'm not sure if this is going to be directed towards Lee. Uh, but Robin asks, were there any challenges with the hybrid processes, the materials required in inert atmosphere, in an inert atmosphere? Uh, yeah, so we um, we didn't deal with materials outside of laser powder bed fusion that needed an inert atmosphere. So the aluminum that was um, deposited on top of the part to encapsulate the sensor um, the Fabrisonics process is a solid state process, so that aluminum can be deposited um, in the atmosphere, and it doesn't have to be in an inert environment um, to deposit that aluminum because you're depositing it in uh, in thin strips using ultrasonics. Um, so I, I can see there would be some potential issues on depending on what type of hybrid you're doing and what the material is um, that, that you could need an inert atmosphere, um, but that's kind of why we went the direction that we did, so we wouldn't have to take that into account for the uh, the second and third uh, processes that we were putting into that part. Hope that answers your question, Robin. That's great, and uh, yeah, Robin of Boeing, and uh, yeah, hopefully this question is answered. Um, Carl, we'll hand it over this to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Yu Ping, and um... Again, thank you. Uh, special thanks to um, Dr. Gao for his time and all of our panel experts for providing their insight and their knowledge to the next generation of added manufacturing. Uh, we appreciate your support in continuing to advance the manufacturing community and well as, as well as supporting SMB events. And of course, a very special guest to all of our attendees who participated this afternoon. I hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Look forward to, look forward to seeing you at Manufacturing uh, webinars. Um, this webinar has been recorded or will be recorded, and we will make it available soon on our AeroDef Prevent webpage. And if you are interested in any past webinars, um, there is an area where you can uh, see on demand all of the webinars we've produced um, for this year. So feel free to um, check out our AeroDef webpage for that. And finally, uh, the next webinar, before we launch into our uh, AeroDef conference in November, is going to be on September 23rd uh, at 3.30 o'clock or 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And we will present the next satellite session on ceramic matrix composites taking flight at GE at Aviation. So uh, registration for that webinar is now open. 
And uh, I see some questions continue to come in. What we'll do is we will uh, we'll have the ability to try to address some additional questions after the fact, and we will reach out independently. And thanks to everyone for their time. Really appreciate it, and look forward to seeing you on future broadcasts. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.